Hello, hello, everybody. Good evening. You can hear me, right? Um, for you, those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, I am Margaret Lowe. I'm president of Atlantic Live, which is the events division of the Atlantic. And I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's forum, Harvest, a conversation about transforming the food we eat. And I do hope everybody got enough food and drink before we sat down. I want to give a hat tip to our chef here um, for the tasty menu, including my very favorite, the baby heirloom carrot pastrami with rye, shallot, vinaigrette, and spicy honey. I really, I actually just really wanted an excuse to say that out loud. In any case, he clearly knew that we have a lot of people here who care about food tonight. And as you all know, food and food systems is the topic at hand this evening, a subject of enduring interest to all of us in this room and to the Atlantic as well in this month's issue. Uh, and there are actually plenty of copies in the back of the room if people haven't seen it yet. Um, we grapple with a very big question, which is, in 2050, the world population will be 10 billion. And the question is, can everyone eat without destroying the Earth? And clearly, this is a critical moment to examine the big issues. Uh, we'll spend our time together tonight doing just that. What will it take to create a more sustainable global food system? What are the risks and rewards of new technologies? Um, before we begin, I want to thank our underwriter, the Agricultural Division of Dow DuPont, for making this evening possible. And I'm pleased to introduce Neil Gutterson. He's Chief Technology Officer of that division. And Neil is here to say a few words. Well, thank you, Margaret, um, and thanks to Atlantic Live and to you for hosting us tonight and hosting this event. Um, it's exciting to have an opportunity to, uh, to get together and talk about uh, the future of the food on our table and uh, where it comes from and uh, the impact of science on, on that food system and the food choices that we have. So I know looking around the room and looking at the invite list, there's uh, a tremendous diversity of perspectives about, uh, about our food, and, uh, and that's great. Um, you know, we wanted to put this together, uh, working with Atlantic, to uh, get some feedback. You know, we talk a lot in our company to farmers all the time. And as we're putting together the new company, the new ag division, that'll be a new standalone company in the future, we're thinking ever more about what that, what that farmer is doing, who they're serving, the consumer that is at the essence of what we do. And so, we want to spend more time talking to people, um, influential thinkers like, you, like yourselves, about the food supply and what we should be thinking about as we help improve the food of the future. So whatever lens we bring to the conversation, um, I think we have some really common um, grounded uh, views of what the food supply should be. Um, it should be healthier. It should be produced in healthier ways. It should be you know, more nutritious and more affordable and, and more accessible. Um, I'm the grandfather of three teenage kids, and one of my fondest wishes for them, having worked for over 30 years in agriculture, is that the food they eat in the next 20, 30, 40 years is exactly that, coming from that better and better food system of the future. You know, I grew up in, in this area. I was born in Manhattan and lived across uh, the Hudson for much of my life until I went to the West Coast for grad school. And when I finished grad school, I just thought somehow that um, agriculture having an impact on the world, um, reducing the footprint of agriculture would be a really good thing to spend my life on. And I have no regrets about that. I, I like um, the work I've had the chance to do and, and uh, working on technology as a scientist that can impact um, the, the food and how we produce it. And I think we've made, we've made lots of progress. There's, there's lots uh, more to be done. Um, today, we're gonna talk more about about that future, as Margaret said. In particular, one of the areas that's uh, really exciting to me is a technology called CRISPR. You have on your tables this uh, little handout that gives you a little description about the technology and about some of the benefits. I promise you, we're not gonna talk about a lot of science tonight. Uh, we're gonna talk about, about benefits. And there are many, we think. I mean, there are certainly benefits to the farmer, but there are many benefits that this technology can, can bring um, to the consumer, whether that is in fact healthier, more nutritious, longer shelf life, um, tastier food. There's, a, you know, there's a, a wealth of opportunities that could come from the application of CRISPR. 
I can give you a few examples. We'll maybe talk more about some of these, but just to leave you a couple things to think about, um, we know that the technology could be used to improve the quality of oils that we consume, making them perhaps healthier um, and more affordable as, as healthier oils. Uh, we know that the technology, uh, depending upon the outcomes of the next you know, years to ahead, can be applied to fruits and vegetables. And so in Japan, folks are working on increasing the level of a compound called GABA, an antihypertensive uh, phytonutrient, that could lead to a, a category of heart-healthy tomatoes. And so there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunities for a lot of improvements. Today, there are no products yet on the market, uh, but there are some pretty soon that are coming. And so we think this is a great time to have this conversation. It's one we started to have the last two or three years. We're glad to be here uh, with you in, in New York. And I look forward to uh, the rest of the conversation tonight. So thanks again for coming. Thank you, um, Neil. And now I have some uh, very quick and very practical notes. Silence your cell phones, please, but don't put them away. Uh, we'd love you to join the, uh, us on Twitter. We're at Atlantic Live. It's one word. The hashtag is Atlantic Harvest, also one word. Um, we want you to be part of the conversation here in the room, too, and we're going to make um, plenty of time for your questions throughout the evening. We know that people are passionate about food and all the issues surrounding what we eat and how we go grow it, and our goal tonight, as always, is to have a meaningful and productive conversation and a, a respectful exchange of views, and we hope we all fit, feel a little bit smarter by the end of our time together. We've got a lot of terrain to cover and a wonderful lineup, so let's get rolling. Uh, please welcome our first guest, author, producer, and Food Network host, Alton Brown, here to talk explore about exploring the edible. And he is here with Steve Clemens, the Atlantic's Washington editor-at-large. Steve and Alton, the floor is yours. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Alton, welcome. I heard you had an invite tonight from the Pacific Magazine. The Pacific Magazine. I know it's going to be a lot more fun, but worse food. It would have been a bit. Right? It, was, yeah. it was more Pacific Rim, though. So, yeah, Pacific you know, Rim. Kind of, and yeah. Too confusing. Yeah, too, it was too a little bit. I just and Teddy, I just want to say, hey, I'm going to be interviewing you in a few minutes. Okay. So nice to see you in the front hey, row. Hey, me first. Gold stars, yeah. Uh, Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Hey. Um, I feel like I'm doing poetry at a little cafe somewhere in the East Village, you know. I thought I was going to get pink rabbit um, slippers. I, it's hard to walk. I came a long way, yeah. so it's hard, it's hard to, hard to walk. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you all about that. Wait a minute. So I have a bit of a confession tonight. So for all of you I, I have not met, I've tried to meet all of you tonight. I'm Steve Clemens, and Margaret Lowe, the president here of Atlantic, often sets me up in impossible tasks. And, and tonight, um, well, what she did to me recently, and you can tell I'm, I'm a, I consider myself the most failed gay man in D.C. because I am no sense of fashion. Uh, and she put me on a fashion panel. Uh, I, I, I also... Um, have a tendency to blow up oatmeal when I try and make it. Uh, my favorite... It can actually be done. You can blow I, up oatmeal. No, I, I, I'm an expert at it. I could do a video like yours on how to do it and on the science of blowing up oatmeal. Uh, and having, and, I, and I, my go-to meal uh, when I'm home, so I'm going to tell you why I'm telling you all this in a moment, is uh, when I'm home alone and, and, and no one is taking care of me and there's no Atlantic party anywhere, I have Lesseur green peas out of a can and dolphin safe tuna out of a can, and that's my dinner. Uh, over and over and over again, people give me cases of Lesseur green peas because they know how much I have. So I like, have now like today, so you've ruined better. my life. I have been all day watching videos of you. Well, I didn't use canned peas, but why do no. you like the canned peas over, like, say, frozen peas? I'm intrigued. Well, because... What is it about Lesseur? Because is it the can? Just, is it the logo? It's the size of the pea. The size yeah. of the <laughs> but, but I did read today that you said that we all need to be either in canned food or frozen food, which we'll get into in a moment. That you I, look I do, at that I as do, the key to sustainability. That, yes. I do. I do. Uh, but I'm, to, to get to serious issues, I was watching uh, many, many, many of your uh, videos today on making French toast and grilled cheese sandwiches, which I tend to hate. But, but all of this stuff I watched Off to today, a great start. And you've taken me down a rabbit hole where I'm so much more interested in a topic that I didn't know I was going to be interested in. And, and I, you know, there's this, any of you know the Hash House, Harrier, Her, Hash House Harriers, the runners abroad? They call themselves uh, uh, runners with a drinking problem. And what I was watching with you was a scientist with or, a drinking problem. With, with, with a food problem, with a cooking problem, you know, and... Science, and, and, and cook so, with a science problem. Yeah, and so cook with a science let problem. me just ask, you know, I, when you started uh, your show and when you were getting into it, because we were just talking about, you said you're not a food guy, you're not a geneticist, you're not a scientist, you've got, you've come in and you said you're sort of a showman, but you have such passion. Showman, I didn't say showman. Well, what did you say? Well, I, 
I was I was a filmmaker. Mm. I mean, I, I used to direct TV commercials, right. and I just got really, really tired of working for advertising agencies. And I cooked all the time as a hobby, and so I decided, you know, I'd really like to try to make a food show. So I'm going to quit and go to culinary school, and that's what I did. So you you take people and and you make it such. I mean, what I was shocked by today is I think I can do some of the things you were showing us to do, and I'm if I can't trust me, you can't. Yeah, yes. yeah. So yes. Uh, and, and I think that what I learned today in watching a lot of it is sort of there's a depth and a con context when we think about food. And we're, we're, part of our job tonight is sort of talking about, you know, feeding the challenge of feeding 10 billion people. But you've taken it down to such a human experience. And I, and I guess what I want to start out with, as you look at this and you look at the challenges we have and go in the United States, you go globally, but let's take, just take the United States where where not everyone has the the, the same benefits of watching YouTube videos, having access to all sorts of things. We're having debates in the United States about, about cutting food stamps and delivering food. What do you think is our job collectively in terms of the equilibrium of access to good food, good cooking? Well, I don't know that there is um, an equilibrium. Um, somebody would have to define for me what will, what equilibrium is. We, we certainly have um, a wide range of disparities as to who can get what food, um, who who has access. Um, and, and I think that one of the, the, the first big mistakes is, is we shouldn't expect the government to fix it. Um, I, I'm 55. I haven't seen them fix anything in my lifetime, so I'm not really going to change that up now. I mean, there was the Fort Pinto recall in 73. They demanded that. But other than that, I don't remember that much. So I don't. I look to business mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to fix things because markets tend to, to kind of establish things. Uh, so um, in our... Our duty. But markets get distorted. Markets get what doesn't. Right. Uh, what doesn't get distorted. Um, my job is to get, hopefully, anyone within the sound of my videoed voice, so to speak, um, curious enough to ask questions, curious enough to look at a piece of food and say, ah, you know, this blah, 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 or, you know, I now know something that I didn't know about this, or I can do something with this now. I don't know if that's going to actually help anybody get better food who doesn't already have it. Um, that, you know, we get into the issue of, of food deserts, which is a, a massive problem. Uh, we get into, well, there are myriad problems about who can but get what food. Let's take food deserts for a moment. What do you? They're what, bad. What, what food, you, food deserts yeah. are bad. They suck. Yeah, yeah, they really suck. It's hard to get good food in a food desert. Um, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and we've got food deserts aplenty um, there. Um, and I think that uh, the the changes, you know, well, I was making not making fun of, but but poking a, a certain amount of fun at, at federal government and not not really fixing a great many things. Local governments, however, are a very very different thing. And I think local governments can and should and do have the responsibility uh, to to deal with that issue. Where I live in Atlanta, that is that's certainly being done, um, uh, simply at the city planning stage. Um, which is one one of the, the things that we have to do. As far as actually making uh, beyond that education, um, and and most certainly uh, being able to get you know people can't eat decent food or they can't get to the decent food. Right. Okay. That's just the way it is. But most of the decent food um, is is put away from them. But you're a big fan of local sourcing, farmers. Markets, I'm a big. I'm a big. And I believe that there's there's a certain number of foods that you know I'm not going to be local, local, local all the time. It right. doesn't always make sense. Mm -hmm. But I heavily believe in community supported agriculture. I think it's one of the the actual linchpins of fixing uh, the problems that we have. And I also think that people should be very very much encouraged. I know it's going to sound terribly old fashioned, but when I've spent when I first started getting into this and started to become really concerned about um, nutrition, especially at the urban level, I spent a lot of time talking to older people who had lived through the Depression and lived through uh, world wars about, you know, you guys didn't have any money. You didn't, you know, rationing was really, really bad. What'd you do? And they were like, we grew stuff. We grew stuff everywhere. I mean, we grew stuff in empty lots. We grew stuff in little piles of dirt by the back right, door. Right. People grew things. They were empowered to grow things. And and then they canned. There were community canning centers. So I think one of the things that we have to do is make people understand that they can. You grow one piece of food, one right. piece of food, and feed it to your family. You are suddenly empowered to do more of that. Right. And I think that part of the problem with food deserts is the utter spiritual gutting of the people that live in them and the fact that there there is no empowerment there very very little empowerment. so given your long i mean we have so many people here tonight uh and we're going to go to all of you but who are in urban farming and rooftop farming vertical farming vertical and vertical you know, integrated and, and, which and, and i think trying is to future. do a lot of these things and you've slammed the california spinach industry and you know shipping to the midwest and well you know, i i i have but, i have slammed yeah not i i didn't 
a I, single I out. thought it was a that slam. A, no, what, what I said I thought it was is a pretty I, big slam. But go ahead. What did you think it was? That shirt. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The more money that we spend and the more resources we spend transporting things that right. ought not necessarily be transported, right. the worse off we are. Right, and this it's was like after throwing an eco, money away. Right. right. Yes, yeah. which is why I believe a lot more in if you're going to ship ship frozen food right. than, than shipping uh, raw food that is but going bad every mile. you make a deeper point, around. not just about the efficiency of it. I thought in your criticism you were also saying – you can grow it all. There's also a human dimension here, that there's a, conne there's a oh. connection that we should have to food and a connection. And once you have. begin subcontracting all of your spinach industry to California, it's yep. saying something about how our obsession with uh, efficiency is undermining the health of the country. That's well, what I thought. Well, on, on a lot of different levels. That what sounds I like was a actually slam saying to with me. the spinach was that I was yeah. saying that if you're going to grow all your spinach in one place and very quickly ship it to a lot of other places, right. by the time somebody figures out that there's a problem, a lot of people are already sick. That was specific to food safety, which is that if you're going to centralize production of something, you are by by the very nature of that model, once you're, you're going to make a bunch of people sick because you can't isolate it. So all of a sudden you've got oh, E. coli is popping up in Minnesota and Georgia and Kentucky and New York, all because of something that went bad in one very specific place. If people in all of those areas were growing something and eating something that was actually suitable to that area, guess what? That would have been isolated. That would not have that would not have taken place. So that's something that we we have cashed in our um, our, our safety. I would say our um, agricultural diversity to some degree by that centralization. And by accepting that, and we're also blowing a lot of money in national uh, natural resources. Where are and you? And by the way, we wouldn't be in such bad shape with our infrastructure right. if we weren't shipping everything over the roads we can no longer <laughs> afford to repair. Where are you on technology? And let me frame. I, I have a, a smartphone. You have a smartphone. <laughs> Do you feel comfortable with but it? I write in a, yeah, in yeah. With a notebook. You okay with it? You write in it. I didn't notice that. I do. I, yeah, but this because this lasts forever. Well, let me when set the electricity this up. goes off, this is. Some, have any of you heard of the, the name Bill Schindler? Anyone here? Yes. So Bill Schindler's this guy. He teaches at Washington College in the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and he goes back to kind of prehistoric. Uh, hunting, killing, food management, all that stuff, and he's setting this up. The Atlantic did a big profile of him, and he did a series on National Geographic. And he is sort of the pre-tech food guy, as I look at it, but ancient, ancient pre-tech food guy. And now we're looking at you know, some of the questions that are coming up on how we feed 10 billion people, how we look at kind of creating, and we've been doing it for centuries, you know, uh, uh, designing crops that feed more people, dealing, and, and there's a lot of controversy around this. And I'm interested uh, in where Alton Brown sees that equilibrium between- Is that a technological question, though? Is that, is that a Well, I think it's a political question. Oh. <laughs> um, well, Maybe it's rephrase, a scientific rephrase question. the question. I, I'm not no. sure that I actually got a so question out of that. I, I, I want to know how you look at when you basically look at technology, what technology is giving us in terms of possible new opportunities, but there are some costs. You are uh, pro can, pro freezing, you're pro uh, 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 local uh, farmers market. But what we see are revolutions. We have CRISPR coming up here, we have people that are creating non beef beef coming up. And I want to know where you are on that dimension of the uh, I rather, like in all I'd rather things, eat yeah. a lot less. I want you beef, to critique beef. my next panel. I would rather eat beef that's real beef. I, I do not have any. I'm going to ask my next panel to respond. And that's, that's to fine. You. Well, well, yeah. it's it's an opinion. Right. So you know it, it's you know genetics is is part of, of farming and agriculture. Okay. Broccoli and a head of cabbage are basically the same plant. The only reason that we have both of them is some Italians in the Mediterranean a long time ago started isolating very specific right. um, uh, characteristics in one plant. So all farming is genetic engineering. We're all genetic engineering, okay? We're an experiment, every single one of us here, an experiment that started in mm. dating. <laughs> Just why, you know, um, I can't and, respond and, to that. Well, you are a result. Of dating. I am a result of dating and a lot of uh, broken promises. Uh, but uh, technology, you know, for when people vilify technology, I, I find that naive, right, uh, and counterproductive. I do, however, find it very useful to ask a lot of wise and what 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 will we what will we do with that and who will decide what we do with that so i tend to say okay technology is always going to happen and amazing things will always happen in technology um, i very often look at technology as okay who who wants that again and why is that happening mm -hmm. um, and who's paying for that and who because in the end understand something 
it's all about business. Right. All of it. I have never met anyone who didn't who did anything that could be as altruistic as possible eventually will sell their business to Starbucks. This will happen. Yeah. The Atlantic tomorrow could or be Amazon. sold to Starbucks if only there was enough money. Or Amazon. May, or Amazon. Yeah, Am- Am- who will yeah. eventually we will get yeah. Children in about three generations, when we say, are you hungry? We'll all look up. <laughs> Wait for the drone. Because <laughs> yeah. that's, that's probably where a good bit of it will be coming from. Um, so technology is, is not, if, if you're just anti-technology, you're kind right. of not a part of, of the solution. I look at, at every piece of technology, what it can do, who wants to use it. And I try to look backwards. I try to look in the review mirror right. and say, okay, well, how did we get to needing that? Mm-hmm. Like, for instance, my, my true belief, and I, I have tortured myself just getting ready to sit here with you uh, for half an hour because um, I, although I try to keep up with everything that's going on, once I knew I was doing this, I buried myself in research, and I've just about driven myself insane. Um, I believe, above all, in diversity. I believe that we do not eat a diverse diet, and we do not farm a diverse series of crops. Right. We've gotten ourselves down to 10% to 20% of what we used to grow on this planet. When the Green Revolution happened, mm-hmm. everybody read up on the Green Revolution? Yes. If you haven't, read up on the Green Revolution because this, this started in the late 40s in Mexico and pretty much ran global uh, uh, agriculture for the, for the better part uh, of the last 50 years. And you've got people coming out here that are actually um, bona fide experts on, on this subject. But, but what it, it brought us to was monocropping, very big business monocropping. It was great for business because you needed to sell really big tractors to people in Africa that shouldn't probably have been growing the things that they were growing. But, and you needed a lot of fertilizers and a lot of pesticides. But the yields were gigantic mm. if you grew a very specific number of things. So um, if, and it fed us for a while. Right. But it was a stopgap measure. It was not sustainable, okay? As very few things are actually sustainable. So now it's like when I look at technology, I'm very often saying, okay, now what part of, the, of that are we, are we trying to fix? Are we just trying to continue the business models that came out of that and the, the massive business powers that now control food because of the success of that revolution? And are we just trying to perpetuate that? I don't know the answer. I think that it's worth looking at, though. But you're a big observer, and you've been doing this for a lot of years now, and I'm just sort of, in, when you talk about diversity and the importance yes. of it, um, if you were to give count, this is an influential room of folks, on do, do, do we need a convention on beginning to look at how you find factors? I mean, you know, big business, the, the, the corporate side that you've talked about is is part of the picture, no doubt, but I, I agree with you. I mean, there was a great New York Times piece just day before yesterday. I read it as I was rushing back here on rice and some sort of ancient rice. Did any of you read this piece? It was great. None of you read the New York Times? There's Aaron, you didn't read the New York I, Times? You know, there's a New York Times writer here somewhere. Uh, uh, it's a great art. I've got it in my bag, but it's, it's um, a, a wonderful story about sort of colonial era rice that has now been found uh, I think in Trinidad, and so this particular rice kernel is being grown in Trinidad. And it was brought there by slaves. It was brought there by slaves. Yes, and it had, been, it had been the staple of rice that had, had you know had been organized, but but and it had been the kind of dominant rice. Uh, Jefferson loved it, friend Thomas Jefferson, and it's gone. And so it raises this interesting question of how you create, how do you how do you turn diversity into a mainstream issue and not just a boutique lament. Well, one of the things I want to say about that rice and many other kinds yeah. of rice is you can't separate it from labor. Because, right. for instance, uh, uh, several uh, varieties of rice that were grown in the lung, low country of North and South Carolina almost went extinct because they couldn't be planted without slaves. The, the ground was too soft for tractors at the time. So you can't, as is always true with these, you can never separate food from the people that are actually putting it in the ground and harvesting it, which is right. farmers and immigrant labor, um, which, which are things that we, 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 we will not be able to fix anything going on with food, right. no matter what technology does, until we figure out li- two things, labor and regulation. Mm. Without those two things worked out, right. all of the rest of this, I don't know if it actually really matters in the long run. I'm going to go to all of you in a moment, but I've got two quickies. I didn't answer. I didn't actually yeah. feel like I well, answered your question. Well, you asked me, be, yeah. you asked me about, is it a boutique lament? Right. I, I want to take time. Like I've, never, out, addressed, out, an out I've never addressed a boutique you know, lament it sounds before. Like a, so, it sounds like a um, way to frame it in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> we got different laments in Georgia. Uh, and I don't know what a boutique is. That's where mom gets her hair done. Uh, Damn, I thought this is a really hard room. Um, <laughs> when we talk about diversity, the, the truth is we don't 
grow a wide enough array of, of foods. We have gotten down, uh, for instance, one of the rice numbers, there were something like 30,000 different varieties of rice grown in China at the turn of the last century. Now there are basically 30. Wow. Um, and, and so what we do is and we, we get down to, to high yielding crops and then we try to coax them into surviving global warming and drought and too much rain one month of the, of the year. Now we're, we're, we're finding ways to get around that. Here in America, young, I think one of the, the great hopes is young people becoming farmers. Um, there's slowly, finally an uptick in young people becoming farmers that are asking questions about everything traditional. And so like we're, we're getting into not tilling anymore. I don't know if any, many of you are aware of the, the no-till movement, which is where you, you don't till under soil anymore after a harvest. You just let it go so that mm. the stubble of the last plant helps to hold water in. And you also don't uh, release uh, carbon and other things uh, from the ground. Right. This is radical thinking in, in the large factory farm scenario, but young people are doing it more and more. So diversity is coming back in. Uh, and of course, some of that we will engineer back in. Right, right. Uh, but some of it's uh, coming back in from, from agri agricultural practices. What, what people in my business have to do, I'm in the media business. Um, you, you knew that. They, we have did, to, they we, didn't. We have to do. We have to do two really big things. One, we have to help people understand that people are so confused about what to eat. We have so much food. We have more food available to us, and the people in this room have more food available than than any culture that has ever existed on Earth. And yet, we still don't know what the hell to eat because we're so overwhelmed by by just the availability of things. And we make the mistake of calling ourselves a melting pot, which we are not. We are not actually a melting pot because if we were, we would actually adopt the food ways that go with the food that we think we've so cleverly adopted. How many people like? Be honest, how many of you? Raise your hand. Oh, okay, pho. How many of you only eat it for breakfast? It's a breakfast food. One of the reasons you don't get fat eating pho is you eat it for breakfast, not for dinner. And there's just so many other, other ways that, that, that that's true. So we, we have to, to be better uh, about That may be our most tweetable moment. Of you, this listen, pho, it's not for dinner. It's breakfast. The other thing is that we absolutely positively, and this gets me to the thing that I'm actually culturally most worried with, and I can tell you're doing the I'm bored commentator sit, is that we must eat the ugly food. We must eat the ugly food. We do not have, listen, we do not have a food shortage. We just have a lot of food we refuse to eat. For every banana that gets imported into this country, 10 get thrown away because it's got a spot on it. Can I tell you that I love bruised bananas? They're the best bananas. They are the best bananas, bananas aren't ripe until they have some black and marks bruised on them. Carrots so and we bruised have carrots. to eat the ugly food. But we have one thing that we must combat, and it's powerful. Right. You looked at your watch while I was seeing No, no, I'm giving ourselves more time, team. We must deal <laughs> with Instagram. Yes. I knew that was in your Instagram book. has done to food what porn did to sex. <laughs> Took it out of context. And now I know who just checked their uh, Instagram feed. Um, <laughs> It rem I'm not, and I'm not being judgy about porn. It. I'm simply <laughs> saying that eventually, if you take one item and right. take it out of an overall context of experience, everything about that mutates. Everything yeah. about our valuing that thing, eating, which, by the way, is a social thing. How many people in the last, in, in New York, I see right. this all the time. You go to a restaurant, and people will be at a table, and everyone is just taking pictures of the food and not looking at each other. That is ultimately sick. That is not well. That is not what we are here to do. And eventually, if we don't deal with that, it's only going to perpetuate Which I know eating you're, the ugly food. So finally, I'm going to go to all of you, and we're going to give ourselves a little more time. Okay. Um, I am really interested. The Atlantic probably got more hate mail uh, after this than virtually anything. We, we get a lot of hate mail. Uh, uh, it's just the nature That's a good sign, though, isn't it? It's a good sign. But we put a picture of a Big Mac on the cover. Uh, my colleague Margaret Lowe is not here yet, uh, but it, it was an interesting, interesting cover. And we argued that the way to health uh, for the country was not promoting uh, the consumption of bruised bananas, but it was taking the McDonald's and the fast food industry and actually trying to kind of re you know get that industry to up up its uh, nutritional buy-in. Oh, and, the, and, and I just, disagree with you. You talk about no, I'm not saying I endorse it. It's an article that we ran. Okay, but you've been talking about the divide between the junk the junk food cost gap with healthy food and nutritional slavery, and I I think it's a powerful frame, and I just want you to take us there in a, in short form. Um, what do you think we can do about that? Well, first off, it's a matter of perception. Mm -hmm. It is not, Big Macs are not evil. Big Macs are dessert. Oh. 
Matter of fact, a Big Mac is dessert for two people. <laughs> I, I remember giving a talk to, uh, to a, my daughter who's graduating in a few months. Uh, she's 18 now, but when she was in like third grade, I gave a talk to her, her school class where I poured a Coke. And this is dangerous in Atlanta where I live because um, we have spigots for it. Um, I, I put a, a glass of, of Coke on the counter and I was like, what is that? And everybody's like, well, it's a beverage. You drink that with all. I'm like, no, that's dessert. Mm. And if we look at what's in it, you'll see that it's basically the same thing as cake, except not quite as nutritionally fulfilling. So a lot of this is perspective. You want your, your Big Mac? Okay, have your Big Mac. Just know you should cut that in half and have that as, as dessert. Oh, and you probably shouldn't have a cocktail either. That'll kind of help counterbalance some of that as well. Um, so but your comment is the cost of dessert has become so cheap. Desserts is, the cheapest the cheapest thing there is because any food that comes from stuff we've gotten very good at processing, and that has a, you know we think you know the more that things can be used in something like corn is a really great example of this um, a, a food that literally is in I don't know what the actual number is now nobody wants to actually share these numbers but corn in some form or another is in something like seventy percent of packaged food I mean it's it is ubiquitous but we don't know it because there's not a picture of corn on the cover is there but it's in everything um, and so the cheaper the more that that a food like sugar or corn or uh, potatoes for instance right. um, can be spread out across our food world the cheaper the cheaper it is of course that's that's basic business. Fascinating. I want to come back to this another time. Okay. But let's uh, take questions and comments. Uh, do, we, do we have someone with a microphone here? Yes, great. Thoughts, questions, or I'm going to go to you because I know I, I actually got to know some of you. My urban farming friend here. Uh, Yay, urban farm. Yes. This the is absolute. Nicole Baum. She's cool. Vertical uh, integrated. Yeah, urban vertical farm. integrated. She does this. So, so, Nicole, I'd like you to tell me in your world, just very quickly, you know, I, I know you're supposed to ask a question, but I'm going to ask you a question. Right. In, in, in this world that we're discussing, how do you look at the world of good and evil uh, in, in the food world? You just set me up. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, all right. In New York. Short form. All right. Gotham Greens, the yeah. company that I work for. We're really focused on actually connecting people to where their food is grown. So similar to what Alton was talking about, I'm not going to answer your question. Uh, <laughs> good versus evil. But um, for us, it's all about giving people a better understanding of where their food comes from and cutting out that long haul transportation and also eating ugly. We have a line of ugly greens, which take anything that's like cosmetically blemished mm. and making it available. This is like. Misfit, what's who's my Chobani friend? Yeah, where is he? Misfit Juicer. Misfit ju Juicer, yeah, right? One of yeah, our, our pal. Uh, uh, Ur urban farming is. I, if, if I'm going to give people advice on investing, <laughs> it would be um, vertical, vertical farm, integrated vertical farming. I, I want my, my tilapia, my mushrooms, and my lettuce to be coming from the same place because they're all going to work together perfectly. Um, and our efficiencies of moving moving to cities, the truth is we are going to continue to urbanize. And and one of the reasons is that that is so much more efficient is one, you're basically, there aren't any villages anywhere. Well, there are, there are villages, but they're all, um, the center of all the villages are no longer local grocers or farmers, it's Walmart. So how do and you I, take the ethic though, what you just shared that you talk about from the hospitality equation, all of that, which really was a Southern thing. And you're talking about cities and urban farming and kind of dealing with all that. How do you connect that to the American South? How do you connect that to Tulsa, Oklahoma? How do you connect that to other parts of the country that you know would see some of this discussion as very that's a city by the very way, convenient? Tulsa. Yeah, well, go to Bartlesville. Uh, uh, but 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 um, they some people look at this discussion as a discussion for rich people. How do we make this discussion relevant to those that don't benefit from dense urban environments and opportunity and wealth? How do we take the practices to other parts? Just real, real short form. Well, I think that that's, that's happening. It's like you can look at parts of, uh, I, I, I can tell you right now of, of uh, a lot of small areas in the south where I know of um, aquaculture taking place where there wasn't aquaculture before. Uh, the best um, trout, rainbow trout, um, in America is being raised by an incredibly sustainable um, aquafarm situation in a small town in Tennessee. Um, I know of some really, really great sustainable catfish operations in the south in very, very small towns. You want to make it work, you make it good business. You make it good business. But a lot of that has to do with regulation, which means that we've got to get the USDA and FDA worked out because we have issues there. There's somewhere, Jen, where's Jen? Oku Farms, do I have it wrong? Where, where? Oh, Yemi, I'm sorry. 
my handwriting's awful. Yemi becomes Jen in certain, you know, <laughs> forms of handwriting. But you have tr you have trout farms. You have fish farms. I have a fish farm. We don't do trout. Yeah. Um, but we do channel catfish. We do freshwater prawns, um, tilapia, and this year we'll be doing the red claw crawfish. They're very pretty lobster. Wow. Well, I just want to put a spotlight on your farm, <laughs> Oku Farms, right there. Uh, questions. All of those, all those animals that she names, by the way, yeah. have really great feed conversions. Mm. You're, you're talking about animals that are very good at putting on healthy weight with uh, minimally in invasive techniques. Am I right, ma'am? Yes, right. they do. Spe tilapia, there's a huge uh, opportunity uh, in, in hydroponics in relation to, to tilapia especially. And crawfish as well. You know, most of the crawfish in this country, or a lot of it's grown in, in rice paddies. And you um, want to do that instead of genetically modified salmon? I say that if you try to modify, if you try to genetically modify a salmon to make it do the things that it doesn't want to do, i.e., respond well to um, to to uh, um, to to farming, okay, you're you're basically trying to teach herd lions. Right. You know, this is an animal with a really crappy uh, feed conversion. You've got to pump a lot of chemical chemicals into it. And so instead of saying, "Well, gee, we're going to fix that by gen by changing its genome," I say simply farm a different fish. Questions, comments, thoughts? Yes, right here. And we're going to bring you a microphone. This is Jackie. Yes, I'm part of the Chobani Incubator crew. Oh, great. Um, I love the Misfit juices. I mean, what they're doing is I'm probably not allowed to say that editorially, but I really do. Yeah, in terms of problem solving, right? Um, yeah. They're a company that's making food, that's solving a problem, using those Misfit fruits and vegetables, turning that into food. And I think it's an interesting approach and relates to what you're talking about. And my team had this debate today, this idea that, you know, like throwing away our food that, you know, the ugly food or whatever, or food deserts. It's not so much that they're not good food options, it's the infrastructure of getting them to the right people or the choices we make. And we had a debate today about the, the kind of blurred lines between nutrition and marketing. And this idea that like, where's education? And I think that, you know, you especially kind of play in this space of education and understanding, not just like the nutrition and basics of our food, but where they come from and the other like opportunity costs and getting them to you. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on like, there's some, there are options out there. It's about the infrastructure of getting them to people, but it's also about kind of, especially to your point of, you know, not just the people in this room having the conversation, but you know, the people living in the food deserts. Like where is the, the education, especially around like accessing better food or more nutritious food mm -hmm. or whatever it is? Like what role does education and, and kind of awareness play in it? It may be the only actual reasonable hope because if, if I can get shipments of ugly but completely nutritionally viable biodiverse foods, into a school program and feed that to kids. Kids do set fires at home. Kids do go home and say, hey, and share. Wonderful things about kids is they are all, doesn't matter where they are from or what culture they are, are naturally curious and tend to be accepting of new ideas. And so I like the idea of infecting kids with these ideas and then sending them home. But then you've got to be able to back it up. You've got to be able to say, well, we can't get that here at home, so shut up and eat your rice aroni, which happens, you know, completely happens. So it's like if, if you're going to do something in a school system, which is just a matter of money, that's all it is, is just a matter of money, and educating teachers better and convincing them the nutritional training is important. If you can do that in school, but then you've got to be able to turn around and then make it available um, commercially, but I think that if you if you do that, that actually can actually become a, a, a business. That That's a viable business because you're creating demand. Does that make any sense? Yeah. I have. have. Delete them. Yeah. Earlier in changing yeah. our attitudes about, you know, yep. types of protein that we... Eat. Yeah, I did a, I did a, 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 a thing at a school in... Uh, <laughs> in, uh, in a, a small southern town, it will go completely in name. Why was uh, it funny? Um, yeah, it was real funny. It was real funny when they ate the chocolate chip cookies and loved the chocolate chip cookies, and then I told them that there was 30% cricket meal in the chocolate chip cookies, and then all of a sudden they were the worst chocolate chip cookies on earth. It was pretty How many of you had chocolate chip cookies tonight? Here. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> The, getting into the the insect discussion is is a whole other thing right. that I am also a really big believer in. Um, I think that you know we, we've got to eat yeah. more fish, we've got to eat more bugs, and, and basically, I don't want to manufacture new meat. I want to just stop eating so much of the meat that we've already got. That's America's single biggest nutritional problem, I think. 
and just finally, I, I just flew back from California and seated next to me on the plane was Walt Mossberg. Walt, for those of you who don't know, Walt Mossberg was the Wall Street Journal's longtime tech uh, writer, reporter, uh, amazing He's retired guy. now, isn't he? He's re yeah, he, he kept telling people he's retired, but, uh, and he used to do the Everything D conference. I thought, you know, with food you could do the Everything F conference, but I'm not sure that that would work. Uh, but but uh, people kept coming up and pitching him and asking them to review his stuff. He says, I'm retired, I'm retired, I'm not doing it. But do people come and bring you recipes? All the time when you all the time. Yeah. Well, what I love when is when people bring me when, when people bring me recipes from other Food Network right. people and ask me to fix them. Uh -huh. I'm kind of like you know, I did, the warranty. There's no warranty for me on this one, um, no. but uh, yeah, that happens all the time. Well, but I'm not, I'm not retired. So. Alton Brown, what a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for educating on this night.